welcome to the itinerary. In today's episode, we will discuss health and safety in tourism. And given New Zealand is world famous as the home of extreme sports and adventure tourism, this is a job we take very seriously. With me today are some people who have pretty much written the book on health and safety. Laurie Keller, industry advocate for tourism industry Aotearoa. Kia ora, everyone. Jen Riley, Outdoors Program Manager for Recreation Aotearoa. Kia ora, everyone. And Malaika Rose, Health and Safety Advisor for AJ Hackett Bungie. So, health and safety, why does it even matter, ladies? Obviously, there's just the basic three fundamental reasons for health and safety, and that's your, your legal, economic and moral um, grounds. Um, a lot of people will rely on legal, um, and quite frankly, that's the most boring and your absolute minimum standard. Um, I think if you think about economic and moral, that's where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck. Um, doing it because you want to look after your people, um, doing it because good health and safety equals good work equals less issues, which is, is better for everybody. I think it's also your organisation and our country's reputation on the line as well, especially when it comes to tourism. We do attract people, we will attract people again from all over the world to our adventurous activities and having a good health and safety record is super, super important to let, let our customers feel, feel reassured that they're going to be kept safe. I think to add to what Jen and Malika said, that it's not just um, our clients and the visitors that we're looking after, it's also our internal teams. Really, really important that we nurture it from within and, and, and go outwards. And possibly one thing that's come, you know, a, a good thing that's come out of um, COVID-19 um, is our ability to look inward and to start fresh and to create some really, really good processes um, in our businesses that help nurture our staff. And then we'll be able to grow that and, and nurture our clients as well. And with those processes, how does New Zealand lead the way in terms of tourism, health and safety? I think our rafting industry would be a classic example of one area that we do lead the world. New Zealand raft guides are sought after around the world. We have a really robust, thorough, training process and assessment process in the rafting industry. And I've worked in lots of countries around the world and I've been asked to raft glide on rivers without having qualifications or without even proving that I can do what they're asking me to do. And that would just never happen in New Zealand. Activity regulations have gone a, a really long way um, in regards to improving um, what we do. Having a full safety management system that is audited and, and regulated is, is really important. And if you couple that with the Hazwa legislation, um, which puts the responsibility where it should be, which is with the owners um, and the directors of businesses, um, for them to fully understand the risks of their business and to control them and resource that controlling. Um, it, people are making real good different gains now, um, having that um, ability to tap into the resource that they need. Also with the um, adventure activity regulations and the introduction of third party auditors um, has been a, a great result for the industry. So we have technical experts that sit outside businesses that are able to come in and, and audit what um, our activity operators are doing. And and to give credit where credit is due, the activity operators in New Zealand um, are on, on the most part exceptional. Um, they generally come from a place of loving the activity that they do and are passionate about it and um, fully support the, um, adv well, they fully support the, the, the regimen of, of their audit. There's um, currently a review that's going underway as a result of um, the Fakari White Island tragedy that is potentially going to make some changes um, to, to the sector. But I think that those will just further strengthen the, um, the auditing regime that, that those operators have to undertake. Our tourism industry is full of extreme adventure sports and activities and options. So how do businesses ensure they are protected in case there is the unfortunate situation of an accident? So we've talked already about the adventure activity regulations. So they came into play approximately 10 years ago. 
And with the result of the Kariwa Island, there is a big review into that. And that's, that's exciting because a lot of questions are being asked of the whole process. And one way that businesses are being able to contribute to this and, and influence um, the, the regime is that we're that we're asking questions of them and, and asking them to to give us give us feedback that we can pass on to WorkSafe and MB. Uh, going back to what Laurie said earlier, it's not all it's it's about keeping the organisation safe, but it's all of the people involved. So as an organisation, as a adventure activity operator, you've got you've got clients, you've got customers, you've got your own business to be looking after and complying with. Um, regulations and proving that you're that you're doing things in a safe in a safe way and thinking ahead to what possibly could happen thinking through emergency procedures of what could happen is something that people I believe do really well. I think we have you know as Jen said we have 10 years of historical knowledge and and it wasn't just when the activity um, regulations came in you know there is a whole history of mm -hmm. adventure activity in New Zealand prior to the regs coming in so you know back in, in the 60s 70s earlier when the first ski fields open so there is a long and robust history of activity in New Zealand um, and there's a long and robust history of safety in, in the country as well. Um, New Zealand is pretty unique in the fact that it has ACC as a support mechanism for any accident and injury. And I would, uh, I, Malika would probably know better than me or Jen um, if that's unique in the world. Um, I'm from Canada originally. It certainly doesn't exist in Canada. Um, we're in a very fortunate situation where um, because of that um, litigious situations don't come about um, that often. Um, but we have a whole series of templates and experts in the country that do this for a living, specific specific to adventure activity and not just generic health and safety, but specific to adventure activity. So the um, Support Adventure website um, is, is a great tool that, that businesses, if they're just starting up, can go and, and find some resources to use as well appropriate processes and procedures um, that can not only minimize the potential of having an, an accident but can also reduce the severity if you do have one um, it, it's re that's really imperative that you understand what your risks are and you and you manage that um, and that you're true trained, trained to it that that your systems are not just left on a shelf to gather dust um, that they're actually um, tested tweaked and improved again and again uh, we've mentioned Fakari, and with New Zealand being prone to natural disasters, uh, how is it that uh, these events fit into the health and safety plans for us here in New Zealand? That's the specific question that the MB and WorkSafe review is addressing. So in a country that exists on multiple fault lines and has a large amount of geothermal activity, where do we go? What sort of resources do we need to be able to have that measure of what is safe and what is, is not safe? And what are the degrees of those safety? So again, that's under discussion at the moment. Operators, for example, like Jen said, with rafting, who will operate in a gorge every day, they understand the changes that are happening. They understand their water flows. They're experts um, in that part of their environment. And we'd be hard pressed to be able to say that someone from Wellington could go, I'm going to be the expert from that from, from my office. It's just not possible. So we need to have a really good discourse between um, operators and government and, and those people who are making those decisions. And I think going back to your first question, how does New Zealand do what it does really, really well? Because of the size of our population and because of the size mm -hmm. of our industry, we're really closely knit. Um, so we all in our various organizations have access to people who can make decisions at a very high level. Um, and that is unique in the world. You know, we're a team of 5 million and that's from the very highest level down to, you know, people just entering into the industry. So we're very lucky in that regard. In terms of um, our colleagues and staff who work uh, within the extreme activities, adventure sports, uh, what is the training available and, and how serious do we take that? Really seriously. So I worked in the Polytech system for 10 years or so, training future sea kayak guides, raft guides, rock climbing guides, mountaineering guides, and those students 
are now out in industry, managing risks, managing customers, and showing them a really um, amazing time while managing those risks. And on a on a two year, one year, two year polytech program, those students are getting put through the ringer. They are having early mornings, late nights. Um, they're out in the wet, the cold, and the rain. It's real. It's stuff that you can't learn in books. It's stuff that no amount of academic health and safety training will train you for. It's being out there, feeling it, feeling empathy for your future clients is, is I believe, the only way to train people for managing people in the outdoors. Um, the polytech process is, is one way, and then you can do lots of on-the-job training. So um, we don't really use the word apprenticeship, but being, a, being an intern, being a, a junior staff member, you're getting lots of training lots and lots of feedback, um, lots of coaching. And like I said, it's out there on the job, in the wet, in the cold, on the river, on the rock. Yeah, I think uh, training is absolutely, uh, I agree, it's, it's integral to having a good product. We have quite, we have less um, organic um, situations than raft guides and, and the like. So we can be quite reliant on, on what we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, but our layers of training and the amount of training that's required to become a jump master is quite significant and, and involved. And it doesn't stop as soon as you reach, reach that jump master level. It's ongoing, there's monitoring. We have to make sure that we don't slip or get lazy in our um, processes. So yeah. Training is absolutely key. Is it all on the job training or do you seek out ex-health or safety uh, professionals that have had that experience previously? Well, just speaking for Bungie, because that's the only one I can actually talk to, um, when recruiting for my position, they specifically went external of the business um, and wanted someone who had health and safety um, qualifications and experience but it's not a one-person job you've got to have that um, health and safety knowledge coupled with the experience and the knowledge of the people that are out there doing it it's a it's a team effort to do it right um, and I think that's that some people think that if you get a health and safety consultant in that they're just going to wave a magic wand and fix everything um, it's it definitely is um, a, a group effort to get the right outcome I think too that you know your health and safety concerns change on a daily basis. You have a, a general, you know, health and safety portfolio that you cover off. But when it comes to anything that's weather related, or you're running an activity that's weather related, things change really, really quickly in the outdoors. So having you know daily feedback with your teams um, is critical to to upskill everybody um, in the organisation. Organisations will also do um, critical incident practice yeah. and training. So we've we've got it written down in our in our SOPs and in our safety management system. We've we've talked about it at meetings, and then we run a scenario. So we're we're out there. We've we've lost someone in the bush, or we've we've got a pinned raft. And now let's talk about what will we do? How will we communicate? How will we talk to the media? Who will talk to the media and running through it in a but in a more of a um, a high pressure wet and cold situation great, those are great. great they're great learnings those ones we used to do them i used to work for a very large um organization um well known in new zealand and it would go from and it was um not an event that anybody knew about there would be two or three people who had created the event mm -hmm. and it would be a surprise and it would be run in real time whilst the rest of the operation was running and it would go from um guide level all the way up through to the board of directors and um, right through the organization across the country. So the fantastic learnings always come from those. They're a bit scary, but mm. they're well worth doing. And we try and make sure that we do something different. Um, we've done big earthquake ones when we're talking about natural disasters. We bring in sim the um, civil defense, uh, make sure that it's all realistic and um, we are dealing with what could happen. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really, really valuable. What are some of the key factors that a new tourism operator should really know before they can launch their business? I'd say go to the Support Adventure <laughs> website because there is a huge amount of resources there, almost spelling it out, um, paint, by, paint by numbers. You need a safety management plan. 
you need to have thought through um, all all aspects of safety. Um, you know your equipment, your environment, your people, and and have a plan for emergencies and weather changes and river flow changes and natural disasters. Absolutely, you need to be able to identify your risks and put that time and effort into um, finding appropriate solutions um, and it's continuous there's no shortcuts um, you know Bungie has been op operating for over 32 years um, and we are not the same operation as we started so that continuing involvement you've got to you just can't do it once and then put it away and I think that in in days gone by I can say that because I am the age I am that um, possibly you started out being really excited about the trips that you wanted to offer and and you know, how you were going to transport people and where you're going to take them and your guide dialogue and all those sorts of things and your sales and marketing strategies and and you sort of took health and safety along with you and i my one recommendation to anybody starting in a business now would be to look at your health and safety requirements first um, because they are significant they cannot be underestimated and that may in some cases help people to decide whether they would just want to keep doing this activity that they love as as a hobby rather than turning it into a business um, because of because of the requirements that are coming i'd also also say um jump on the internet and look at who else is doing something similar and i recently spoke to, uh, to somebody who was starting a stand-up paddleboard operation up in the north island and, and he, I suggested that he contacted somebody that already runs a stand-up paddleboard company down here, and just they're in absolutely no competition with each other. Like Laurie said, we're we're a team. Um, we really are able to to talk to each other and to help each other out. And yeah, there there are requirements, and this person hadn't hadn't thought about um, Department of Conservation concessions on the land that they were going to be using or regional council um, permission that was that was going to be necessary let alone the, the health and safety requirements. Now let's hear the career pathway story of Devon Rawlinson, who has made a fantastic career for himself in tourism and as a health and safety expert. Hi, I'm Devon Rawlinson. I'm the safety systems manager here at EcoZip. So my responsibility is mainly to do with training and making sure that we comply with all the Health and Safety Work Act and the adventure activities regulations, being a role model for any of the new young staff and you know just communicating with all the management team. So it all started, I grew up traveling a lot. I really enjoyed doing activities, going to touristy places, and I always thought those people looked really cool. So I wanted to become one of those really cool people. <laughs> I did a bit of study in tourism and went straight from there to working for AJ Hackett Bungie. So I was there for 10 years where I took advantage of all the training, all those extra opportunities. From there, I then went on to become the National Health and Safety Manager for Schindler Lifts and then started teaching. So I was in charge of the tutor team at ITC and taught there until I then got this opportunity to work here at Ecosit. They were looking for a new safety manager, so I just pounced on that. Health and safety is crucial for tourism. You just think of it as tourism as a whole, like New Zealand as a whole, if one operator has an accident, it doesn't just affect their business. It will have that ripple effect where just every business takes a hit. New Zealand's a special place. You know, we've got all these adventure activities and a great thing is with these activities, you know, we're really innovative in coming up with new ideas. We don't get shut down. People won't come with red tape and tell us we can't do that. It's all about that risk management and that's where we're special. We're able to manage that risk to give us that opportunity to explore. You know, we get to go out into the mountains, out into the ocean, into the lakes of these rivers. So yeah, we're special in that way. So if you're looking to work in tourism, skills that I mainly look for is communication. Customer service is also a big one. Go work at McDonald's, get that customer service skills up. Tourism, I found that a lot of the health and safety stuff is done in-house because a lot of these sites are very site specific. You know, I went from my previous role at Hackett's, I just took the opportunity with any extra external training or any additional up skills that I could grab. Through that, I then bumped up my health and safety skills. I then was able to get to work at Schindler Lifts. They also really liked my skills at working at Height. Even though with Hackett's, a lot of their stuff was internal. At Schindler, I was lucky enough to do lots of external courses and get fully trained at Height, being able to actually train other people. I then went to teaching and then, yeah, just kept working, building up on all those skills. 
So there's this perception that careers in tourism are really unstable. I disagree. You know, just through my career, you know, I was able to build up skills, took all those opportunities to upskill, get those external courses added on. And then that went from that tourism role to a more office-based role, and then into the classroom, and then eventually back out here. <laughs> nice and active in a more active role outdoors. Skills that you learn in tourism, they do apply to any other job that you might go to. You know, it's very versatile. You don't, you're not stuck just in tourism. You can explore different options.